Constantinople, November 14th, 565. For the last 38 years, Justinian had ruled the Byzantine Empire. It had been a reign of great reform, great unrest, great conquest, and great disaster. He led the Byzantine Empire through some of the most difficult years in human history, but for better or worse, Justinian's leadership had seen the empire through it in one piece. At any point, and with the next catastrophe always lurking around the corner, his reign had been marked by the almost single-minded pursuit of one goal, the reunification of the Roman Empire, the melding of two halves separated generations before. It had been three years since the peace with Persia, and the same since the full subjugation of Italy. In that time, with the help of some locals sympathetic to Justinian's goal, he had also overseen the annexation of parts of southern Spain, while the Visigoths, who had previously held that land, were occupied with unrest elsewhere. He had beaten his enemies, settling their issues on the battlefield, and had taken vast new lands for his efforts. Now he was 83 years old, lying in bed, weak from his old age. He knew he did not have much time left. It's interesting to speculate on what may have been going through his mind in these last days. Perhaps he was recollecting on the successes of his rule. In his first years, he had drastically overhauled the legal system of the empire, and while there was initial pushback to these reforms, the changes he made were now well entrenched and accepted. These reforms were revolutionary in a number of ways, and would continue to play a foundational role in legal doctrine in the minds of jurists and philosophers to the present day. Even in American law, these reforms would be so influential that portraits of Justinian and Trebonian are prominently displayed in the U.S. Capitol, along with other important jurists. It could be he was thinking of his building projects. He had left his mark on the city through his revolutionary architecture and magnificent buildings, many of which still stand to this day, withstanding years of plunder and conquest and outliving the very empire they represented. Most prominently, Justinian's Hagia Sophia, built in the wake of the Nica riots, became a landmark of Constantinople and still stands today as perhaps the most well-known feature of the Istanbul skyline. But maybe he was thinking back to the Nica riots and lamenting the catastrophic slaughter of his subjects that occurred on that dreadful day. The massacre of almost 30,000 people in the Hippodrome would be a black mark of his reign and stands as one of the darkest days in the city's history to present times. With the legacy he would leave, the reflections of the dying emperor could perhaps be more numerous and bountiful than any other. Of course, Justinian could not have possibly understood the extent of his legacy while he was alive. We will never know his thoughts or feelings on his deathbed, but I find it plausible that running through Justinian's mind was a simple question. What if? The plague had struck the empire at perhaps the most inconvenient time possible. While his conquests were ultimately successful, most of Spain and Gaul remained out of his control. The plague had given the Goths ample opportunity to bounce back, and it had seriously hampered Justinian's ability to fight. Had the plague not struck, could the Goths have been defeated in year 4 instead of year 20? If that were the case, what would have happened after that? Perhaps Justinian could have marched his armies into Gaul and Spain, lands once conquered by the great Romans of the past. Perhaps he even could have reclaimed Britannia, marching his armies to Hadrian's Wall and reuniting a great empire that stretched from Egypt to the North Atlantic. Yet these magnificent ideas did not come to fruition in spite of Justinian's every effort. As he lay in bed, the emperor began to feel a weakness overcome him. He knew that it was almost time, but he had one order of business left. The only other person in the room with him was a chamberlain named Callinicus. Weakly, Justinian called for his ear. Leaning over and listening with intent, Callinicus heard the emperor whisper, softly uttering the last words he would ever speak. After he had said his piece, Callinicus leaned back and sat still for some time, deep in thought over Justinian's whisperings. As he pondered, accompanied only by the emperor's ever-fading breath, he noticed its rhythm becoming slower and raspier with each passing moment. A short time later, the room fell silent leaving Callinicus alone to observe an eerie peace settling over the emperor, his exuberant energy finally dissipating. Feeling uneased, Callinicus rose, walking out of the room and into the next, where he approached the emperor's nephew Justin. 
he informed him of the Emperor's demise and that Justinian's last wishes were for Justin to take the throne. He would rise up and be proclaimed as Justin II. The Emperor is dead. Long live the Emperor. Whether or not these were truly Justinian's last wishes, only Callinicus would ever know. Without any doubt, Justinian was an almost uniquely competent emperor, but as he put his empire on the path of reunification, he also put it on the path of instability. The new territories were never consolidated, and the state of the world Justinian had left would require someone almost as uniquely competent as himself to fill the imperial shoes and keep things together. Poor Justin II was simply not the man for the job and things almost immediately began falling apart as soon as Justinian was gone. Just three years after his death, much of Italy again changed hands as a Germanic group called the Lombards invaded. Justin II foolishly prompted yet another war with Kostra, who this time was far more successful. Lastly, the Slavs and Avars had begun crossing the Danube to settle into Byzantine territories, presenting similar issues that the Goths and Huns had created a few centuries prior. Poor Justin needed more armies than ever, and he needed them everywhere. But Justin would not get his armies. The plague saw to it that he would not. While it was nowhere near as devastating as the initial outbreak, the plague would stick around for two centuries. It would flare up, simmer down, and then flare up again as it wreaked havoc across the Mediterranean, keeping the population from booming like it had before. While in their time, the people of the Mediterranean had no clue what could have possibly been causing this illness and no doubt explored many a superstition in search of the answers, today we have a much better understanding of what could have been at the center of this catastrophe. The culprit you're looking for is not found in a creation of man. It was not sent as punishment from a god. It's not caught after walking through a cloud of toxic gas. You can't ward it off with an amulet and you can't be rid of it through leeches or bloodletting. In fact, humanity wouldn't have any tools to deal with it until the next millennium. You wouldn't know if you had encountered it until you fell ill, and it can't be seen without special equipment. What you can see, however, are those whom it resides within. The rodent, the flea, and the human. Over millions of years, life has evolved in different ways, for better or for worse. As complex species came into being, they became reservoirs and hosts for other types of beings too, namely, bacteria. As some of the oldest forms of life, many species of bacteria have developed a symbiotic relationship with their hosts, each of them mutually benefiting from the other and enabling each other's prosperity. But, sometimes bacteria develop a more malignant relationship to their hosts, a parasitic one. Sometimes these bacteria become pathogenic becoming capable of doing terrible harms to those whom they reside within. The way these pathogens cause harms is, in simple terms, chemistry. Many of them will feed on their host cells, turning what was once providing life into acidic waste. Others actively secrete harmful toxins. As they continue to grow in number, the chemical reactions they cause damage the cells, tissues, and organs of their hosts, causing all sorts of issues that are often deadly. As insidious and evil as these pathogens seem to be, the pathogens themselves have neither a concept of evil, nor even a concept of their own existence. The body is not completely hapless to this faceless terror, however, and once a body detects these pathogenic agents in its system, it will fight back by triggering an immune response, a highly complex coordination of different cells and proteins that work together to eliminate the invaders. Sometimes, this immune response is toxic too, causing its own harm to the body, but most of the time, the body's immune system fights the bacteria by producing antibodies, proteins, whose job it is to identify the guilty pathogens and then mark them for the phagocytes, your white blood cells, to consume and break the pathogens down. If the phagocytes win, then the body often becomes immune to the pathogen, as the immune system is now trained to identify and eliminate the pathogens in a much quicker and more coordinated manner. But bacteria are always evolving too and many have developed their own counters, becoming much more difficult for your immune system to deal with. Okay. 
Yersinia pestis, a bacterium commonly found in rodents across several parts of the world. For thousands of years, the bacteria likely lived within its rodent hosts, slowly evolving with the passing of each new generation. Like many pathogens, Yersinia pestis develops a sort of modus vivendi relationship with its hosts in order to survive. The bacteria and its host being prevented from attacking each other, the pathogen is allowed to coexist within the infected rodent. However, many newborn rodents within their populations are still susceptible to Yersinia pestis, and the bacteria can cause symptoms within these susceptible rats that can be deadly to them. As the rodent population wanes and booms, so does the population of susceptible rats, and the number of new potential hosts for Yersinia. But first, Yersinia had to figure out how to get these new targets, and the way it did so turned out to be catastrophic. After possibly centuries of having transmission difficulties, Yersinia pestis evolved to take advantage of the perfect vector, one which would enable it to jump from rat to rat in just a few seconds, the flea. As parasites who feed on rodents' blood, fleas can infest animals in numbers stretching from tens to hundreds. Where rats go, fleas will also go, and if the rat were to die, the fleas would leave to look for another. Yersinia found a way to take advantage of this relationship by using the fleas to hitch a ride to another rat. When a flea ingests the blood of its host, the bacteria in the blood would be ingested as well. Once inside, the bacteria causes different cells to stick to each other, forming a black biofilm in the flea's foregut. This biofilm acts as a blockage within the flea's digestive tract and prevents it from feeding itself properly. Eventually, the flea will lash out in hunger, jumping from host to host on a feeding frenzy. Most of the time, the flea will look for another rat, but if there are no other rats in its near vicinity, it will jump to another species, including humans. This is where things really start to get dicey. When the infected flea tries to feed on a human, it pierces the outer membrane of the skin, but instead of taking in blood, the flea will regurgitate the infectious biofilm and the Yersinia pestis bacteria into the bloodstream. Now in normal circumstances, Yersinia pestis bacteria have an outside layer of proteins which we call YOPs, for Yersinia outer proteins. The function of YOPs is to more or less protect the bacteria from phagocytes. However, during the transmission process, the layer of YOPs that were previously protecting the bacteria are shed when the bacteria enters the human bloodstream, leaving the bacteria vulnerable to attack, which is exactly what happens. Immediately, an immune response is triggered and the vast majority of the invading Yersinia bacteria are destroyed. However, there are certain macrophages that can encapsulate the bacteria but are unable to destroy it. The macrophages carry the bacteria through the body's lymphatic system all the way to the lymph nodes. At first, the bacterium is unable to harm its captor, but the macrophages' days are numbered. In possibly just a few hours, the bacterium redevelops its antiphagocyte layer killing the macrophage and releasing Yersinia pestis into the lymph node. Once released, the bacteria begin to multiply and what we know as the bubonic plague begins. Symptoms appear in the unfortunate victims just a few hours later. The body recognizes something is wrong and again tries to coordinate an immune response, causing the symptoms that we typically see with it, fever, fatigue, aches, and more. The bacteria multiply within the lymph nodes to overwhelming numbers causing the node to swell up into what we know as buboes that gradually become more inflamed and painful as time goes on. Eventually, the bacteria destroy the lymph node, cutting off blood supply and causing the noteworthy black necrosis of the skin. They then release all kinds of toxins which continue to break down the body, leading its host closer to death as time marches forward. It can spill out into the lungs and develop into what we know as pneumonic plague, a version of the plague that adds respiratory symptoms, making the plague far easier to spread and far deadlier, causing mortality usually within two days. After destroying the lymph nodes, the disease can develop into septicemic plague, the bacteria spilling out and infecting the bloodstream once again, releasing toxins all across the body in an infection that is almost always fatal. Eventually, the body will either learn to fight the infection, granting permanent immunity, or the host will die. The Plague of Justinian that began in 541 CE would be the first of three bubonic plague pandemics, each of them causing a near-apocalyptic degree of devastation and indescribable suffering. With that in mind, we have just a few questions left that need to be answered. Why here? Why now? And what happened after?
Sicily, 536 CE, the onset of the Gothic War. Quote, During this winter, Belisarius remained in Syracuse and Solomon in Carthage, and it came about during this year that a most dread portent took place. For the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon, during this whole year, and it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse, for the beams it shed were not clear, nor such as it is accustomed to shed. And from the time when this thing happened, men were neither free from war, nor pestilence, nor any other thing leading to death. End quote. Procopius of Caesarea. Five years before the onset of the plague, the year 536 was marked by one defining feature, one that remains foreign to almost every person alive today, the absence of the sun. Many would have panicked at the reality of waking up to a dim outline in the sky where the sun used to be each day. Others might have even thought this marked the end times. What they could have never known was that the cause of this existed possibly thousands of miles away, nor could they have known how close to the end times they truly were. The culprit of this phenomenon was the exact same culprit that caused the destruction of Pompeii over 450 years prior, volcanic eruption. Though historians do not know exactly which volcano it was, Sulfate deposits recently found in Antarctic ice samples indicate the strong likelihood of heavy volcanic activity during this time. The result of this activity was a significant amount of sediment being launched into the Earth's atmosphere, covering the planet in ash and sulfur, and darkening the skies taking years to dissipate. The resulting state of the Earth is what we call volcanic winter. Now, you might be wondering why I'm talking about this event. After all, it seems completely unrelated to our story of plagues and emperors. However tangential it may seem, the volcanic winter of 536 would play no small role in the times to come, perhaps being the perfect case study for the butterfly effect. The volcanic winter brought to the world its own cornucopia of crop failures, famines, and other catastrophes, but the most noteworthy effect for us was an approximate 2 degrees Celsius drop in global temperatures. Xenopsila chiapis, the species of flea that infects ratus ratus, the black rat. It bears repeating that where rats go, fleas will also go. While this is true in most circumstances, fleas also have a preference for temperature and will be much less common in territory that is uncomfortable for them. In this case, Egypt. Its temperature being too hot, it simply would not do for the finicky Xenopsila chiapis fleas, and they were less common in the area. Fortunately for the fleas, they would soon get their chance to see the Great Pyramids as, what do you know, a volcanic winter causes the temperatures to drop significantly, enabling the fleas to colonize the area in much greater numbers. At the same time, enjoying the lower temperatures, the population of rats in the area began to boom as well, many of which were susceptible to the plague. With the population of rats and fleas in the Nile Delta booming, the disaster had been written on the wall. Soon enough, the bust came, and the susceptible rats began to be killed by the plague, giving Yersinia pestis ample opportunity to jump to the dense human populations of northern Egypt, which it did in droves. And while we're in northern Egypt, let's take a look at another crucial component in the formulation of the pandemic. Grain. While rats will eat pretty much anything, they especially like to munch on grain, and Egypt was full of it. With the arable floodplains of the Nile Delta, Egypt was one of the top producers of grain in the Mediterranean. If you remember, Egypt's constant grain surplus led to it exporting grain to the rest of the empire, especially Constantinople. With these exports, with these grain caravans and merchant ships, came the rats, and thus, Yersinia. So you see, the formulation of the first plague pandemic was not random at all. It came about as a sequence of critical events that no one could have seen coming. First, critical relationships needed to form between rodents, fleas, and Yersinia pestis. Second, the conditions needed to be just right for these species to be in Egypt at just the right time. Third, Egypt needed to have the right goods to bring the rats aboard and the necessary infrastructure and demand for their goods to export the plague to the rest of the world. It's strange to think about. It seems so unlikely that something like this would occur. Yet because of Egypt's fertile floodplains and abundance of grain, it's almost inevitable that something like this would have eventually happened.
Ultimately, experts still disagree on where exactly the plague came from. Some argue that it came from the Eurasian steppe, but because of the path the plague took, it seems more likely to have come from a plague reservoir in modern-day Ethiopia, where ancient historians report the plague as being endemic to the native population. Regardless, the plague moved into Egypt and was exported to the rest of the Mediterranean, where it wreaked havoc. From there, it moved into northern Europe and Arabia, though in these areas it was substantially less devastating due to trade moving slower and their sparse populations. Eventually, nearly 60 years later, it's likely the plague reached China, as a disease was similarly described by court physician Chao Yuanfang. Though it did evidently reach China, the densely populated region seems to have been largely spared by the plague since trade between China and the West largely consisted of goods like silk, which were not consumable by rats. As such, the export of the plague to China did not occur to nearly the same degree. The plague proved to be a grisly transition between late antiquity and the Middle Ages. Estimates of its overall death toll vary wildly, but range between a shocking 25-60% to of the European population. The Mediterranean over the coming centuries saw a continued increase in peasant rights due to the continual high demand for their labor. Over time, the rich became poorer and the poor became richer, propelling into society a larger middle class. Eventually, the power and rights of the peasants extended to the point where they were able to inherit land, bequeath land, or simply leave their land for elsewhere. For all of antiquity, the Mediterranean was the seat of the heights of power and civilization. Egyptians, Mycenaeans, Macedonians, Romans, Carthaginians, and more all built thriving and prosperous empires which ruled, expanded, clashed, and declined all in their times. A short while after the events of this series, the Mediterranean flame would appear significantly dimmer than it had in previous centuries. Technological innovations led to an agricultural revolution in Northern Europe, with the populations there booming, and thus shifting much of the balance of power northwards. Over the coming centuries, we would see strong, capable medieval kingdoms establishing themselves in France, Germany, and England. The Byzantine Empire reached the height of its territorial expansions under Justinian. From here, they would see a long and protracted decline, with many ups and downs along the way. Italy would be split up between numerous squabbling states, the peninsula not seeing reunification for almost 1300 years. The days of Mediterranean power projection were dwindling. Lastly, a new religion would establish itself in the Middle East, and its devout followers, who had been far less afflicted by plague and famine, would find themselves stepping out of Arabia and founding an empire that would stretch from the Indus River to the coasts of Portugal. While there were no doubt many crucial factors leading up to these events, it's important to ask ourselves this. Would these events have occurred had the population of the Mediterranean not been cut to size? Would these events have happened were it not for the plague? Well, it's been a long journey from where we began to where we are now. I first want to thank all of my patrons, subscribers, and viewers for all of your support along the way. Also, a special thank you to those who have contributed to the project, I couldn't have done it without you. As for the series on the plague, it is with bittersweet feelings that I say, that's a wrap. However, that will not be the last time we hear from our good friend of the channel, Justinian. While we work on the next big project, I have content planned to delve into some of these topics in a more analytic fashion. Until then, thank you again for watching, and I hope everyone has a safe and happy holiday season. Marcus